Hello class, and today we are going to be engaging with critical medical anthropology, which is a subset or subfield of medical anthropology, itself a subset or subfield of cultural and also biological anthropology. Again, there's a lot of nested hierarchies here of different ways of doing anthropology. And on that note, this is going to be focusing on my research in the country of Belize concerning Zika virus, but also dengue fever in the country. And Devin, another Devin in the class, you will probably see a lot of familiar material here because this is going to be pulling from that guest lecture that I gave to Dr. Romero Daza's infectious disease class earlier on in this semester. I have Nat Geo here, National Geographic, because my research was funded um, by the society and I went there to the country of Belize for multiple months to conduct primarily Zika virus research and afterwards I went to the organization, I presented my findings, but I mentioned this because A, it's good to know that usually research is funded by some institution and they're going to have their own goals and aims when they, for instance, decide to give you money. And you have to sell yourself in a certain extent to be able to get their money. And additionally, if you want any, let's say, advice towards getting a grant to do your own research, I can help you with that as well. Uh, which is something really important when you're considering going to a graduate program because you'll need to start thinking about funding opportunities for yourself to do your research, especially if, if it's international research as well. It can get very costly, both in terms of the time commitment and also the economic commitment. So it's good to know some of your options that might be available. You may have just heard my cat running around my apartment. I'm going to briefly go over some key figures, so let's say anthropologists, as well as some of the theories they have developed over time that are of relevance to this discussion in terms of my own work, but also in terms of critical medical anthropology in general. So Merrill Singer, a very famous medical anthropologist, perhaps the most famous medical anthropologist in terms of the amount of scholarship they have produced, may be tied with a rival to Paul Farmer below that, he has been a major proponent of really two major theories or paradigms. So engaging with the first, the political economy of health model of thinking about health disparities. Remember, political economy basically just argues that you can't separate the discussions of economics from politics. They are entangled with each other and it is very hard to disentangle them. Policy influences economics and in turn, economics might influence policy. However, when you tag on of health to this framework, you are also arguing that political economic processes, let's say policies that affect, let's say the ability for someone to pay for services is going to impact their health as well. If you're unable to afford a certain service because let's say your insurance does not cover it, this is a form of structural violence. And structural violence kind of falls into political economy of health because it argues that, again, you must look at the overall structures, the policies, the economics in place, and how those shape disparities. So really, when I'm talking about the political economy of health in this class, I primarily am also talking about critical medical anthropology in general, which is basically a research paradigm, which is basically, if you remember, a paradigm is an, a larger umbrella that theories fall into, right? And this particular paradigm incorporates critical theories, including the political economy of health model and let's say structural violence to critique the causes and explanations for health inequalities. So let's break down those two separate things or seemingly separate things. So to critique the causes for health inequalities, you can think about this in terms of basically a lot of the things we talked about in this class before. So let's take, let's uh, for example, maternal and child mortality for black women in the United States. As you recall from the readings in our discussion, there are multiple underlying disparities that shape the availability and access and treatment of black pregnant women in the United States. You can think about this in terms of structural racism, basically policies in place that unequally favor, let's say white women over black women, which is also tied to economics. So for instance, not being able to afford certain services, which will then increase your risk for maternal and child complications. So that basically is the causes, for one example at the very least. Basically CMA argues that there are structural 
political and economic factors that shape health. And oftentimes we talk about this in terms of the negative consequences of these actions, but they also can talk about the positive. But CMA primarily is dealing with the negative so that we can bring to light real disparities and potentially find ways or solutions to those longstanding problems. However, there's also another key component here that I think is very anthropological, and that is critique the explanations for health inequalities. To give an example, I'm actually going to pull in Paul, Paul Farmer a little early here, because I think it's a good example. So Paul Farmer is a, a medical anthropologist, but also a physician. He's both, so congrats to him for going through that much effort to get those two different degrees. But his work in Haiti, he found that public health policymakers were often blaming the culture of Haitians for a cause basically or an explanation as to why they were practicing risky HIV behaviors. According to this model, there's something about Haitian culture that was making them act more risky in terms of HIV AIDS. They weren't wearing condoms as an example, and it was they were blamed for not wearing condoms. So again, remember this neoliberal framework of personal responsibility you should be a good citizen. You should practice good public health by wearing a condom. And if you don't do that, you are somehow failing as a citizen. You're failing as an individual with rational choices and decisions. However, what Paul Farmer found was that when you blame the culture for something that is largely outside of someone's control, you are blaming the individual too. What Paul Farmer found was that the economic and political con conditions of Haiti at the time was shaping risk for HIV AIDS, basically limiting people's agency to be able to make healthy decisions. So as an example, let's take what's called survival sex practices in the literature. Survival, survival sex basically is a form of um, sexual relations that basically argues that oftentimes women have to have sex just to be able to survive in their society whether that's because they need it for, let's say, economic reasons, they're poor and it's a source of income, or two, if they don't, for instance, consent, quote unquote, to sex, then they may become raped in the scholarship. So do these women have a lot of agency to be able to, to, to say, negotiate wearing a condom with their partner? Not really. So Paul Farmer is saying that you must also look at the system that someone belongs to before you go and start blaming people for, let's say, practicing unsafe sex, as an example. This also applies to my own work as well, and we'll get into that in a little bit. But Paul Farmer basically is the structural violence guy. Uh, most of his work concerns this framework. And let's take his work in Haiti and also in Africa concerning Ebola, as an example. Paul Farmer's work in both Haiti and also in Africa, all over Africa for the most part, he's an international traveler as well as researcher. He found that during the Ebola crisis in particular, there were multiple ways you can talk about failures in the overall system that was shaping disease burdens and also health outcomes. He called this the four S's, that is stuff, space, staff, and systems. I flipped that, but I'm sure you can read. So for Paul Farmer, he found that to address Ebola, there was a, a critical lack of staff, which is literally, let's say, the nurses and physicians to be able to adequately address and treat Ebola at the time of the 2014-2015 epidemic in the country. Um, I think this was in the Congo, to give a more precise area in Africa. There also was a critical lack of space. This is the hospitals as an example. There's not a lot of hospitals to be able to, let's say, quarantine someone or give them an IV drip so that can get, they can get hydrated. Of course, there's going to be issues. The stuff relates to the space, but the stuff primarily is, is there enough medical equipment? Is there enough, let's say, PPEs for healthcare workers to be able to treat patients and not get sick themselves or to, or to transmit the disease either? And then the systems is the policy. Are there policies in place, both at the public health level in the country, but also let's say the World Health Organization or the CDC, to be able to adequately support all these different interlocking systems? If you don't have the policies in place to, let's say, provide affordable healthcare infrastructure, there's going to be very real disparities that primarily impact the poor. 
So basically this framework of stuff, space, staff, and systems is an overall way of thinking about structural violence, where if these aspects are lacking, how is it fair to blame, let's say, culture for doing so-called risky behaviors when people don't really have a lot of options available to them? Think about this again in terms of, let's say, the Ebola discussion I had on the previous lecture. If people don't have, let's say, pr protective equipment when they are burying the dead, of course, they may be more susceptible to getting Ebola from handling the body. However, if they don't have the staff to inform them about how this can potentially cause the disease to spread, if they don't have the right equipment to be able to, let's say, safely handle a body when they are depositing it or burning it, how can we really blame them for that, especially if they don't have a lot of knowledge in the biomedical sense of how this all works? So it is very important to understand the structures, the policies, the economic context when you're looking at a certain disease so that you don't inadvertently and very problematically start blaming individuals for decisions that they really don't have a lot of say in. A few more key figures and terms. So there's Michel Foucault, which I've mentioned multiple times in this class, and his work concerning the concept of biopower. And remember from a previous lecture that biopower basically is the state's capacity and want to control your, bo your bodies. They can, for instance, throw you in jail for breaking a law. That's you violating some sort of policy and them taking you your physical body and putting you in a space that you are having a limited ability to interact or enact your agency within. Then tied to biopower and kind of offshooting from that is reproductive governance by Lynn Morgan and Elizabeth Roberts, two anthropologists and feminist scholars. Reproductive governance, as you remember, basically is just saying, okay, biopower is a thing that exists as a concept in, in which to analyze certain disparities in. However, we must also look at in particular examples, let's say in terms of abortion access or family planning access, where the state is able to restrict, let's say access to abortion services. But we must also ask, okay, why might they be doing that as well? And that often is tied to both cultural factors. So let's say there's a strong Catholic uh, religious base in the country that's influencing policy that is going to have an impact on the ground for the women that have to navigate this system. And then in terms of mosquitoes, which I'll be engaging with here, because we're talking about Zika virus and dengue, Alex Nading, another medical anthropologist, he has a theory he calls entanglements, which I use in my research all the time. And that is any separation between nature and civilization, as we think of them, are themselves social constructs and mosquitoes are intimately entangled with humans. So let's take the first part of that, nature and civilization. Scholars have argued for some time that there is this Western dichotomy between, okay, this is civilization, this is nature. However, we interact with nature on a daily basis. So where is that really dividing line there? If people are living in rural areas, as an example, are they in nature or are they in civilization? Where's the drawing line in the sand essentially there? People interact with each other all the time. They move around all the time. So to create these sort of false dichotomies, these false categories can make public health really challenging because we are looking at the world or a certain problem in a way that does not reflect the reality. In terms of mosquitoes, the species that primarily transmit Zika virus and dengue, Aedes aegypti, they like to bite humans, or well, at least the females do. The males are pollen feeders. What is meant by they are entangled with humans is that we can't think of mosquitoes as only living out in nature. We can't think of humans as only living in civilization. We also interact with each other on a daily basis, depending on where you live, of course. And in Florida, we can kind of hide in our AC environments, but in Belize, where a lot of people can't afford air conditioning, and they don't have, let's say, bed nets or long sleeve clothes because it's too hot outside, they probably are going to get bit by mosquitoes at some point. So we can't think of them as this little animal that is off in the periphery that we can simply control with fumigation. Because as the scholarship has shown for many decades, fumigation simply is not enough. 
And this can lead to complications, again, in public health policy. If we were just focusing on, let's say, fumigation in terms of a strategy to prevent the spread of Zika virus and dengue fever. This will get more clear as I go throughout the presentation, hopefully, but just know that basically entanglement says that there's a lot of false categories that we use when we talk about, let's say, human health and also the environment, that once you actually start looking at them and give examples of how this is not exactly fitting reality as we know it, we need to find a better way of doing things. Now I'm going to give you a brief overview of both the Zika virus, the mosquitoes that can, can uh, transmit them, and also my own work. So the Zika virus, you probably most remember this in discussions of microcephaly in the news, which is basically the small cranium size of an infant. So on the right here, we have a CDC chart, basically just a way for you to visualize this more easily that at the top shows a quote unquote normal or typical head size for an infant. Below that, we might have a baby with microcephaly. As you can see, they have a reduced cranium size. Then below that model of microcephaly, we have severe microcephaly, which is a severely reduced cranium head size for an infant. I, would, I should say that there are not just these three categories basically of head sizes and also what may be typical for one head size, let's say in the United States, may be very different compared to the head size of, let's say, an infant in Brazil. But just know that there are some gradients here in head sizes, and also there are gradients in terms of the consequences of contracting Zika virus during pregnancy. Which is why now, for the most part, we don't just talk about it in terms of microcephaly in the scholarship, we talk about congenital Zika syndrome basically just an umbrella catch-all term that says there are multiple complications that can arise due to Zika virus infection. This also relates to what's called Guillain-Barre syndrome or GBS, which is a condition that can compromise your immune system and also cause short-term or long-term paralysis, not just for infants or the fetus, but also for grown adults as well. However, that is very rare and for the most part, individuals will just see the symptoms of Zika virus which are actually pretty mild, all things considered. You might get a rash, conjunctivitis, which is basically red eyes, joint or muscle pain, or maybe even a headache. If you're thinking about this, you're probably saying, oh, those are pretty mild symptoms. They kind of mirror common, the common flu as an example. Well, two things when we talk about that. If the symptoms seem pretty mild, for the most part, most people don't really think about Zika virus as a concern especially if they are not a pregnant woman because they can't contract the disease and spread it to, let's say, their offspring. However, Zika virus can be spread both sexually and also by mosquito, not also in, uh, talking about how it can be spread through blood transfusions and also during pregnancy, as I mentioned with microcephaly as an example. So a, let's say I have Zika virus, I'm showing the, at least the symptoms of it, I may not be that concerned about it. However, if I get bit by a mosquito, or let's say I practice uh, unsafe sex, I may transmit it to somebody who then could pass it on to their fetus in the womb, as an example. That being said, Zika virus, like dengue fever, is usually asymptomatic, which means that I could have the disease right now and have no idea because I'm not showing any symptoms. This is the same with, let's say, COVID-19, where a lot of people may be carriers of the disease, having been infected by it at some point, but are not showing any symptoms. They still are able to transmit it to someone else, but they may have no idea they have it personally. Since Zika virus is usually asymptomatic and also very mild when you are showing symptoms, it is really hard to do good epidemiological work because people simply are not getting tested, either out of the fact that they don't know they have Zika virus or that they may think it's not that much of a concern for them if they know or not if they have Zika virus uh, and are an active carrier of it at the time. So I usually show this slide and I blur out the right side because I want to see what people's sort of understandings are of Zika virus because it's been out of the media for a couple of years now. But as I mentioned, Zika virus can be spread not just via mosquito, you know, that is the most common means of transmission. It can be transmitted through pregnancy, through what's called vertical transmission, which is similar to how HIV can be spread from the biological female to the fetus. And also through sex, which is a very important component when you're doing Zika virus research, because you can't just look at the mosquitoes in the so-called natural environment. You must also look at, let's say, condom use practices in the country as well, 
and also, let's say, the rates of other STIs in the country, because I may give you an idea of how much of a, how much of a broad scope you must look in terms of condom use practices, the rates of HIV AIDS in the country, the rates of gonorrhea in the country. If people have a lot of STI burdens in Belize, it stands that Zika virus most likely will spread um, significantly through this means of transmission. So you can't just look at mosquitoes, which makes Zika virus a pretty interesting and kind of unique disease in that um, regard. And then blood transfusion is probably the most or the least common means of transmission for Zika virus. And that's because simply it's easier to screen now. At first, we weren't sure if it could be transmitted via blood transfusions, but now we have a better understanding of that. So it is also a means of transmission. So there are many, uh, many ways to get Zika virus, the most common of which is getting it through mosquito. And the mosquito that most often transmits Zika virus is Aedes aegypti, which is very common in the country of Belize and also in Florida too. I like to take a global perspective when we're talking about infectious diseases, because really, as you can see with COVID, for instance, these are global problems. And they require global thinking and global solutions if we are trying to find ways to alleviate them. I think this is best encapsulated in the discussions of global warming and climate change. So taking this chart as an example, the yellow highlighted areas are areas where mosquitoes will breed seasonally. Thus, they will spread diseases seasonally because they will be interacting with humans and spreading diseases they might have during that time period. The red areas are locations in the, in the world where mosquitoes will transmit diseases because they are breeding throughout the year. So that means that, let's say, Florida as an example, you can see around Tampa Bay, it's red, meaning there's mosquitoes here basically all year round. However, look at North Florida, it's yellow, meaning the, the species that are of interest to this chart are not seasonally breeding. However, once it starts to get hotter, and it is getting hotter in Florida and all over the world for that matter, the viable area for mosquitoes to breed will start to increase because mosquitoes need basically what's called the, the Goldilocks number, a high temperature to be able to viably breed in a given area. So if temperatures start to rise, there are going to be more viable areas for mosquitoes to breed. It's really impossible to show on this chart, but Belize, which is a very small country in Central America, about a two and a half hour flight from Florida, is considered to have year long mosquito breeding in the country, which means there likely are going to be year long burdens concerning infectious diseases related to mosquitoes in the country. For example, dengue fever, a disease that is spread by the same primary species as Zika virus, Aedes aegypti, is found year long in the country. And there is thought to be endemic, meaning basically diseases that are there for the foreseeable future unless something is done throughout, throughout the country. So dengue fever is endemic throughout Belize. Zika virus, where I do work at, is endemic or was at least declared endemic on the small island where I do work at in the country as well. Basically, this is just showing you that we can't just think about also just the physical environments. We must also think about the temporal context of infectious diseases. As people get more interconnected and globalized, infectious diseases will more easily spread. We can see this with COVID-19 as an example. But additionally, in terms of global warming, as temperature averages rise, we're going to see more infectious disease burdens as a result, because there'll be more mosquitoes going over a larger geographic area into areas that have never really had mosquito problems before, introducing more disparities in health burdens in areas that previously were not affected. This leads to a discussion of the importance, really, of words. And I think that is best thought about and conceptualized in terms of infectious disease burdens in the, in the US, but also globally. So think about, again, COVID-19. The most common sort of narrative as for how this disease started to spread was that it started to emerge as an emergent infectious disease in Wuhan, let's say in a wet market in Wuhan. As the cases started to propagate and spread over a geographic area, this became an epidemic. An epidemic literally is just that. It's a disease that is spreading over a short period of time in a certain geographic location. 
as soon as that disease starts to cross borders, and diseases don't really care about borders, that they themselves are social constructs that we create at the policy level and the geopolitical level, this will become an, a pandemic potentially. So as cases started to spread from China, it started to become a pandemic. The declaration of a pandemic actually creates a lot of different policy interventional um, complications and also obligations for countries. So let's say the World Health Organization declares COVID-19 to be a pandemic. There are mechanisms at place for when that happens to start to, for instance, service different countries and give them relief efforts, as an example. Additionally, when a disease is declared to be pandemic, countries have to start thinking about, okay, should we close borders now? Should we restrict travel? Again, sort of showing how policy is also tied to discussions of health because it's going to start to shape the consequences of a disease, for example. So let's take New Zealand uh, in this matter in terms of COVID-19. They are able now to basically kind of have an open country, not in terms of having people travel into the country, but they aren't really on lockdown in the way the United States is because they have been able to, through their earlier interventional efforts to control the disease. So now people are going to rugby games and football or soccer matches without really that much concern about COVID-19 because there's no disease spreading in the country essentially. Then take, let's say the United States, um, for example, and a more recent example in, in particular of the University of Florida's coach getting COVID-19 after he encouraged fans to go to the stands and sort of pack them basically a week later. So we have a problem here and it's both political in terms of what are governments doing about COVID, but also it's cultural. How are people understanding those policies and understanding this disease? And how is that going to manifest in what they actually are doing so-called on the ground as well? So this is sort of a macro level way of thinking about it, but it's going to have consequences for the individuals and communities on the ground that have to sort of navigate this policy and disease environment. This relates to endemic diseases. And as I mentioned, basically an endemic disease is a disease that is actively spreading, let's say throughout the year or the foreseeable future that has no real end in sight. So when it is said that dengue is endemic in Belize, it is thought that the disease is going to spread year round and you kind of have to just deal with it in terms of, let's say, periodically spraying for mosquitoes when they get quote unquote bad. And also in terms of people just having to get, to get bit by a mosquito and probably getting dengue fever throughout their life. In Belize, getting dengue is not that really much of a I hate to say it, but it's not really much that, that much of a big deal for most individuals because this is something that you have to deal with, with your round mosquito breeding in the country. Of course, dengue fever can have very severe consequences, especially if it's the hemorrhagic variety of dengue fever. But many, many, many people I spoke with said, oh yeah, I've, I've had dengue fever in my life at some point. But also when you ask them if they've ever been tested for dengue fever, a lot of people will say no, because they just know they have it in their terms. And that's tied to a lot of economic and also cultural conceptions of the disease in the country, which I'll also get into in terms of Zika virus. This also is tied to neglected tropical diseases or NTDs. And NTDs basically are the next basically logical, also problematic step after an endemic disease is declared. If people start to say, well, dengue fever is just a part of life. At some point you will, you will probably get dengue fever all we really can do is just periodically fumigate so there's less mosquitoes. It can be called a neglected disease because it's just part of daily life now. It's not actively being addressed or trying to be eradicated as an example. So this can create a sort of feedback, feedback loop as well, where if a disease starts to kind of just simmer in the background, there could be an, another epidemic or outbreak starting this whole cycle over again as more cases start to spread. I saw this with dengue fever in Belize because when I went there again in 2019 to do more follow-up research, I jumped in basically at, at the height of a new dengue epidemic as more cases started to propagate in the country. So Zika was at, at the back of people's minds because there was a more pressing matter in their minds and that was dengue fever in the country. So I had to start shifting my work from Zika virus at that time to dengue fever.
That being said, this work will primarily deal with Zika virus because I think it better sort of encapsulates and shows some of the underlying disparities I've talked through throughout the rest of this semester so far. Now let's talk about Zika virus and police. So Zika was an epidemic in the country in 2016 through 2017, roughly. But it was declared endemic in Keycocker Island, where I do work at, in 2017. We must really think about disease burdens as not always reflecting the reality of epidemiology. Epidemiology tries to track disease burdens, disease morbidity, disease mortality. However, it is often constrained by the reality of the context it is trying to get an idea of, as an example. <clears throat> so first, let's go over this chart and go over the numbers, basically. So this chart is from the Pan American Health Organization, which is an offshoot of the World Health Organization that primarily deals with Latin America, as an example. And they were trying to assess the disease burden of Zika virus in Belize and also in Guatemala and Nicaragua, to give an example also too. So in Belize, they have a chart here that shows the confirmed cases and also the suspected cases. The confirmed cases, to put it simply, are me going to the doctor, getting tested, and then that test coming back positive. That then positive test is reported by the doctor to the Ministry of Health in the country. Then they tabulate that with the rest of cases to come up with a basically a base number of cases in the country. <clears throat> now, a suspected case of Zika virus may be me going to the doctor's office showing symptoms of Zika virus, potentially, and the doctor basically making an educated guess. Okay, he was showing signs of rash and he had joint pain. These could be Zika virus. So I'm going to send this off to the Ministry of Health as a suspected case of the disease in the country. As you can see, there are a lot more suspected cases of Zika virus in Belize than there are confirmed cases of this disease in the country. And this also is, is from 2017 and 2016. This basically is a snapshot of when I was entering the field. You'll see here the numbers at the bottom. These are called epidemiological weeks, and they kind of start, let's say January 1st is the first week, and they go from there. So I was in the country around 2017 at about epidemiological week uh, 10 through, I think, 20, if I remember correctly. So I was kind of there at the tail end of one of the large clines of cases in the country. And a cline basically is just an uptick of cases in, in epidemiological terms. I mentioned this because when I was in Keycocker Island and I was asking healthcare professionals, do you think the Ministry of Health's declaration that endemic Zika is on this island is correct? I often heard, we don't have the numbers to support that. At the time of me being in the field, they only had 50 confirmed cases in Keycocker of Zika virus out of a population of about 1,700. So the Ministry of Health, acting on really only 50 confirmed cases, is saying this disease is going to be here for the foreseeable future, and we have to kind of just deal with it. Through a lot of people, and the healthcare environment, this was, kind, this was kind of crazy to them because they know it's just going to be another problem that the Ministry of Health kind of just deals with like dengue fever, where you periodically spread. And when mosquitoes are so-called and are spreading rapidly and are bad, but that means if they're at to the point where they're bad, they're going to be biting people. So they're going to start spreading the disease again if those people are infected, as an example. So what can you really do about that? And I think this also speaks to something that I annoy public health people all the time with, is that epidemiology, honestly, is just best guesswork. You can make an educated guess, but you will never find the true reality of disease burdens in the country. You can get a good representative sample, but that also is really hard given the constraints on the ground in Belize. So for instance, let's say you are a rural individual living in a Maya village in Belize on the western side of the country. Let's say you are showing symptoms of possibly Zika or possibly dengue fever, and you are thinking, oh, should I go to the doctor's office? Okay, now keep that in mind. Now, keep in mind that Belize is a very rural country that doesn't have a lot of doctors and that doesn't have a lot of hospitals. If the nearest hospital to me is 15 miles away, 
I may be less inclined to go to the doctor's office, especially if I don't have a car. That's a large time and money commitment because I might need to, for instance, buy a taxi service to go to a larger city to go to a hospital's office or go to a hospital or a doctor's office. Additionally, not every clinic in Belize is able to test for Zika virus. So then I have to decide, okay, should I go to a private clinic doctor and pay for a Zika virus test that is very costly, and I make, let's say, minimum wage or even below that in a lot of cases in the country. Okay, so now I'm having to pay for an otherwise supposedly free service according to the Ministry of Health. I can't afford that, so I'm not gonna get tested. Or I may, and what I found in my own research, people are actually going to pharmacists and asking them, hey, I have this rash, do you think it's Zika virus? And that ends up being basically their sort of informal diagnosis. So a lot of people aren't going to get tested for dengue fever or Zika, especially if they perceive it to be a pretty mild condition that you kind of have to just deal with because they're endemic diseases in the country. So these factors are going to shape the epidemiology. So you may think that you have a, rep a representative sample, but unless you actively are doing tests as a part of that research and endeavor or that initiative, you really don't know if this is rep representative or not. And it may be biased by the fact that let's say in Belize, you can only get a free Zika virus test at a public clinic doctor if they actually have that service. If you are a pregnant woman in the country, if you are non-pregnant, if you're a child, or if you're a male or a man, you cannot get a free Zika virus test. So then you are shaping who is getting the test, which is going to shape the epidemiology of the disease as well. So very quickly, where is Belize? I'm sure a lot of you were asking that question. So Belize is about a two and a half hour flight southwest of, of Orlando. I'm using Orlando as a reference here because I primarily did my research from the University of Central Florida when I was doing my master's research. And then I would fly to Belize, to Belize City in particular, and then I'll take a boat ride to the island of Key Cocker, or we would say probably Kay Cocker, but it's because of them being a former British colony, there's a lot of linguistic sort of quirks about the country, which I think are also very interesting. But Key Cocker Island is that small little island on the right chart here that oftentimes is not found in a lot of maps of Belize because it is so tiny. Essentially, it's about a mile and a half by about a mile to a mile and a half, depending on where you put the measurement stick at, because there are two smaller islands that are also a part of Key Cocker, but for the most part, people live on a smaller southern island where a lot of the tourists go, as an example. I have gone three separate years to Key Cocker Island in particular, but also other areas in the country in 2016, 2017, and 2019, with a gap between as I entered the uh, PhD program here at USF. And a part of my work was ethnographic, which again is basically anthropological research, as well as geographic information systems or GIS, which basically is mapping data and making it visual, but also running statistical analyses on them too. In terms of my ethnographic methods, I did personal observation, which again, basically is just hanging out with community members, veteran control workers, with healthcare workers, and also tourists on the island, getting a better understanding of the local context and also getting people to be more familiarized with me so they feel more comfortable talking with me, which also produces data as I start to ask them questions during informal conversations, let's say about economy use practices in the country, cat calling in the country, the spread of mosquitoes on the country, how bad it is, what do you think about Zika? What do you think about dengue fever? All these questions start to become more organically interwoven in the conversation as you get better at doing field work, basically. Additionally, I also performed more formal interviews among community members, vector control workers, doctors, basically all the groups I mentioned earlier to get a better understanding and have more richer contextualized data than just what I could get from conversations, which themselves are fantastic sources of data. But interviews give you a lot more detailed information in which to work on, basically. So a lot of my work deals with, in terms of anthropology, talking with people. That really is anthropology. It's just there are different ways to talk with people. There are different ways to interact with people that can give you different kinds of data also too. In terms of my GIS work, I primarily am mapping Zika risk factors, basically. And you can think about this in terms of environmental risk factors for mosquito breeding, as an example. 
So the chart on the right here is me splitting the island up based on my own understanding of the geography and also me talking to local individuals into an urban zone and a rural zone. So the urban zone is also basically where all, where all the tourists go for the most part. That is the black outline on the top right part of the island. The rural zone, which also is where a lot of people on the island actually live, is the southwest portion of the island here. Mosquitoes need standing water to lay their eggs. Once a female mosquito bites you, they then create blood meal, which they can use to start producing eggs in standing water. So on this chart here, you have these little blue circles uh, wrapping around rectangles. Those are sources of standing water on the island. These circles themselves are basically an approximation of a risk zone, basically, of me, in a, based on the literature saying, okay, mosquitoes travel X amount of distance in their lifetime. So I will create a boundary around that as a way to show, for instance, if someone is walking by the standing water area, are they at risk for potentially getting bit by a mosquito? Likewise, I have here sources of garbage. That is the high and medium dots on the map. You might ask, what does garbage have to do with mosquito breeding? Actually, a lot. As has been found in the scholarship, mosquitoes oftentimes will use standing water in garbage, so let's say when it rains, to lay their eggs. So if there's a lot of garbage in a certain community, and there's a lot of mosquitoes there, it's a good indicator that this garbage may be being utilized by mosquitoes that like to hang out by humans because they bite us to produce their eggs. Additionally, once mosquitoes start to mature over time from their egg to larval stage to their adult stage, they need somewhere to dry their wings. And what has been found is, let's say they deposit their eggs in standing water. As they develop, they may crawl out of the water and start to basically dry their wings in their, in their final stage of development on top of the garbage. And then they are a, a viable adult mosquito that will start biting you essentially. As a side note, if you ever get the opportunity to go to the University of Florida and get a tour of their basically mosquito lab, they actively breed mosquitoes basically all year round. It's a very fascinating tour, at least for me. And uh, you basically get to see this process in the different stages because they'll show you the egg stage, the larval stage, the adult stage. And that helped me sort of get a better understanding of what I was dealing with before I actually went to the field as well. This is a picture of the tourist strip, as they call it, in Key Cocker during a big event in the country called Lobster Fest, where a lot of tourists come from all over the world and also from Belize proper to come enjoy uh, cheap and pretty abundant uh, quantities of lobster and also other marine life as well. Uh, this is a big time for the island to make a lot of their money for the basically the entire year because otherwise it's a pretty sleepy little island. It's a tourist location, but it doesn't get a lot of thorough traffic for the most part, especially because of Zika virus concerns. At the time um, when I was there in 2017, a lot of businesses actually were impacted by people, for instance, canceling their trips, their wedding vacations, their honeymoons, because they were concerned about contracting Zika virus, let's say if you were a pregnant woman, as an example. In some cases, business owners told me business was down about 40% compared to last year, and they thought this was due to factors including Zika virus, but also, for instance, the threats of travel bans in the country and other concerns as well. Key Cocker tries to sell itself as a, basically a cost-effective tourist experience, right? And that selling point is great for the most part in, in attracting tourists to the island, but also it, since it is a tourism-based economy, they are very sensitive to outside influences that may impact their daily lives and livelihoods. So for instance, a lot of business owners don't really like talking about Zika virus because they are concerned, rightly so given what I just told you, that it may impact their bottom line and also their ability to, for instance, care for their families. So again, it is a very pretty location, but also, of course, this is the tourist strip where most people actually walk on a daily basis if you're a tourist. While the majority of islanders also live in the very rural areas um, out of sight, essentially, and they get a lot less attention from the Ministry of Health and also the village council on the island because basically most of the money is 
what you're seeing in this image, not what's found on the side streets, as an example. So I mentioned research questions um, throughout the semester, really, but I wanted to show you some of mine so you can get an idea of what kind of questions you can ask and how they can kind of play into each other. So my first broader question was, what are the experiences of communities in Belize with Zika interventions? And remember, I've showed you the slide before, but again, I just want to touch on it here once more. So this, this first question is very broadly getting at what are the perceptions of Belizeans, basically, with Zika virus interventions? How do they perceive fumigation efforts? How do they, can, how do they perceive the healthcare infrastructure trying to adapt to the Zika virus, if at all? And then additionally, this, this ties into a more structuralist point of view of, what, of for instance, objects as a materialist perspective. To what extent do healthcare discourses and community preparedness initiatives shape perceptions of Zika-related health risk? For instance, how do people perceive the Ministry of Health in the country declaring Zika virus to be endemic on Key Cocker Island. As an example, business owners thought it was very unfair that the Ministry of Health was telling people that Zika was endemic on the islands when there wasn't really a lot of cases because they know it's going to impact business. Likewise, a lot of business owners kind of tuned in to what is happening globally. We're very annoyed that the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, or the CDC, was telling people not to go to Belize because they have Zika virus there. Meanwhile, at that same time, we were having localized transmission cases in Miami, Florida. They weren't saying don't go to Miami. They were saying don't go to Belize. So a lot of people were really annoyed by that because they were saying the CDC was being hypocritical at the time. And of course, this ties to policy and economics because again, Miami is another big tourism industry. So there was a perception that the reason they're not talking about cases in Miami was because they don't want to talk about cases in Miami because it may impact tourism, as an example. Additionally, the third question here is, how do different communities perceive Zika? And communities here, you think about communities of practice, which is I mentioned earlier on in this semester. So how do, for instance, doctors perceive Zika virus? How do nurses perceive Zika virus? How do business owners perceive Zika virus? How do vector control workers perceive Zika virus? These different communities that all interact with each other are going to have very different perspectives, probably, because of their backgrounds, their education, and their economics, essentially. So it's important to get that more broad sort of shotgun approach to seeing, let's say, what are perceptions of a certain thing in a certain community, as opposed to just taking a narrow point of view and just asking, let's say, doctors about Zika virus. An important perspective, but also you need to contextualize that because people, again, always are interacting with each other. And you're not always just a doctor. You're also a doctor and a community member of, Z of Belize, as an example. So these three questions get at interrelated issues and also perceptions. And so it's important to have multiple sort of slightly diverging, but also interrelated questions when you're developing a research project so that you have a better understanding of what is happening on the ground when you get there. And it also serves as basically a primer for yourself where you can say, okay, am I getting at the point of my research question here when I ask this question? Am I wasting my time? Am I wasting my participants' time? Why are they talking about X when I'm trying to talk about Y? Should I start talking about X in my own work too? Is, it, is this important for people to understand and talk about? So again, our cues should basically be pretty adaptive to your environment. They're not rigid. I could change these over time. I actually did change these over time. And if I had more time for this presentation, I would show you the first iterations of these, but you probably don't really care about it anyways. But just know that over time, your questions can change based on what you're seeing on the ground. And that is perfectly okay as well. But as long as you have a starting point in which to work from, that's the key point here. In terms of what is being done on the islands, there really are four sort of things to engage with here. The first is vector control. So the Ministry of Health will basically tell Keycocker Village, okay, you should probably fumigate today because we're getting reports there's a lot of mosquitoes there. So that report gets sent to the, the village council and Keycocker, and then they tell their uh, workers, okay, go fumigate today. So what happens is, is vector control on the island is very contextualized and also based on economics in the country as well. So this blue truck here is both the island's uh, garbage truck, but also it is the vector control vehicle. 
So what this looks like is that for the most part during the day, this is the island's dump truck, essentially. They will collect garbage from the trash cans in certain parts of the island, which we'll get into shortly. And then they will deliver that to a offloading center, basically, and then that will be picked up by a garbage barge when there's enough garbage and taken to the mainland. However, when it is time to fumigate, they will offload any garbage that, that may remain and then load on the back of the pickup truck the fumigation machine here, which is the green machine you're seeing in this image. And then they will drive in a predetermined path ar around the island and start to fumigate, basically spraying chemicals into the air. And those chemicals act as an insecticide and can control the population of mosquitoes when they're so-called in a, in a bad amount of breeding, essentially. Uh, I would say over time, this truck started to fall apart. And when I went there in 2019, there actually was a new truck um, that had more readily available access to air conditioning. Because in 2017, when I was doing observations with the, the vector control workers, we would have to sit in the car with the windows down because it was so hot. And that whole time you're getting bit by mosquitoes because you're going in, into mosquito basically areas because that's the whole point of fumigation. So the workers themselves and me were being exposed to a high degree to mosquito bites, which could potentially lead to infections if that mosquito, for instance, were to have bit someone else earlier who was infected with Zika virus or dengue fever, as an example. So that's basically the vector control on the island. Sometimes if there is a confirmed case of, let's say, dengue fever on the island, the Ministry of Health will send in specialists with handheld fumigation machines, and they will go to, basically through the neighborhood of the person that was infected and spray the neighborhood. However, if no one's getting tested, they don't really have any incentive or they don't have a reason to go into the neighborhoods and spray because the, the system in place requires that there have been a confirmed case already. Now, in terms of litter management, which is tied, of course, to the dump truck on the island, most of the garbage on the island that is available to be placed into garbage cans is in the tourist area of the island. And by that, I mean the village council provides free trash can services in the tourism district of the island. So when you're a tourist and you're walking down the island, usually there's a, a trash can like the one I have on the right here to put your garbage in. However, look at this garbage can closely. Well, you can't, you really can't, right? Because it's, it's inside of a metal box, or sorry, a wooden box essentially. What I found and what I was told basically by members of the village council and also business owners was that the trash cans are placed in these boxes and there are little slits on top to put your garbage in because people will start to throw in their own garbage bags, let's say you're an islander, to utilize this free service. And that is not the intended pr purpose of this trash can. So what ends up happening is these services, islanders perceive them to primarily be there for tourists, while islanders themselves have to pay to have their garbage to be collected which many people either cannot afford to do so or don't think that they should have to pay for, essentially, which leads to a high amount of garbage littered on the islands, especially in the rural areas where a lot of people actually live. So the tourist district is pretty, basically the, the word I would use is policed for garbage. They pick it up constantly. There are people raking up garbage constantly. In the rural area where there's less attention to this, because really there's no optical need to do this in terms of the, the, the village council as an example, there's a lot more litter. Go back to that slide where I showed you the map and you'll, again, you'll see a lot of the garbage is in the rural area of the island. Additionally, the Ministry of Health and Belize produced educational campaign, basically pamphlets entitled No Get Bites, written in Belizean Creole as a way to entice people to read it. And these pamphlets basically give you a primer of, okay, these are what Zika virus symptoms are. These are what dengue virus symptoms are. However, if you actually look at that pamphlet, the symptoms basically are the same. And doctors told me that this pamphlet basically ends up being kind of useless because you don't really know what you have until you get tested. But no one's getting tested because it is too expensive at the private clinic doctor, usually for most people and they don't provide free Zika tests or free dengue fever tests in Key Cocker. They must travel to another island or to the mainland, which means that an otherwise possibly free service at the public clinic now has a cost added to it of travel and also time as well.
And in terms of the surveillance, as I already mentioned, if you have a confirmed case of Zika or dengue fever, this gets reported by a doctor to the Ministry of Health. The same thing with a suspected case. But again, Key Cocker can't test for dengue or Zika unless you go to the private clinic doctor. And that test can be a lot of money for most people making basically minimum wage or again lower in a lot of sort of so-called informal economies as you sort of read in your reading for last week as well. So these contexts all intermingle with each other. And it's important to have this more broad, holistic sort of perspective concerning the environmental, political, and economic conditions in Key Cocker. When you're thinking about, okay, is the disease endemic here? And if it is, what's that going to mean for Islanders also too? This is an overview of the pamphlet, and I'm not going to spend a lot of time here, as I already talked about it briefly um, previously, but as you can see here by Dr. Garcia, the private clinic doctor on the island, he says, nothing comes as a book tells you for diagnosis, especially with Zika being usually asymptomatic. They must be tested to make sure. Other diseases can be too similar. He's arguing that this pamphlet, largely by association, is not that useful, because again, if you check the symptoms here, for Zika and Dengue, they both mention fever, headache, joint and muscle pain, and rash. So if you're, you're using this pamphlet to diagnose yourself, basically, you may not know what you have. Additionally, from a neoliberal perspective, look at the right language here of the action verbs, get rid of places, keep your home and neighborhood clean, wear light colored clothes, use mosquito repellents. These are all personal acts that supposedly make you basically a better, more responsible person in the face of disease. However, if you break some of these down, no one wears light colored long sleeve clothes in Kikakar because it is a very tropical environment. It is really hot. People don't have bed nets because they either can't afford them or they don't want to buy them. You can't, for instance, use air conditioning or close your windows because again, it is too hot or you can't afford an air conditioning services. So a lot of these preventative measures, so-called, don't reflect the reality of the ground. And if you don't do these things, you may be blamed for being irresponsible, despite not having the right staff system stuff in space to be able to adequately assess and address Zika virus in your community. So let's take an example here of Rodrigo, a local fisherman I spoke with in my research in terms of his personal responsibility or his perceptions of what that means. And this can kind of be tied to how this neoliberal discourse of personal responsibility can become internalized and embodied by participants in, in a given community. So as, as Rodrigo says, government guys came and advised us to take litter to the dump to stop mosquitoes from getting bad. I agree because a man should be responsible for his own litter and his own health. That's why he also gets tested. Here you can see Rodrigo sort of internalizing both that he needs to get tested to be a, a responsible guy, a responsible citizen, and also to pick up for his garbage and bring it to the dump site. However, Rodrigo is also very cognizant and aware that it is very expensive to have your garbage to even be accepted at the dump site. You can't just freely go there and drop it off. You must pay to have your garbage to be collected, either by the truck picking it up and you paying that for that service, or you going there in person and dropping it off and having for it to be paid to be processed, basically. So here he is combining both testing for mosquitoes, diseases, as well as managing litter on the island. Additionally, the Ministry of Health recommends getting tested for diseases twice a year, but I may be going once or once a year, if at all, because when I'm not feeling sick, I don't, I don't see the point. This gets to sort of the hypocrisy of this responsibility sort of discourse at the policy level, that the Ministry of Health is saying, hey, if you're being responsible for your own health, you're getting tested twice a year. However, Rodrigo recognizes, despite saying what he did above, that I don't really follow that recommendation because if I don't feel sick, what's the point of me going to get tested? So again, this is a problem in public health and epidemiology where they're saying one thing, but community members are going to interpret that differently because of the, lo the local context that makes it in their mind unreasonable or maybe not even logical, for instance, to go get tested twice a year. So reproductive governance and Zika monitoring in the country. Discourses and policy primarily target women when it comes to Zika virus. For instance, the Ministry of Health urges people in this endemic location on the island to postpone their pregnancy. Think about that though. 
An endemic disease, according to the Ministry of Health, is going to be there for the foreseeable future with no end in sight, right? You're telling women to postpone your pregnancy. How long are they supposed to postpone their pregnancy? It's just not realistic. And whenever you tell people to postpone pregnancy, this often is a failing public health sort of model that doesn't reflect reality of what happens on the ground. People get pregnant all the time. It just is a part of life. And to tell them to be so-called responsible and knock you pregnant, despite not having any really options to do so, doesn't make sense for people on the ground. I mention that because abortion access in the country, as an example, is very, very hard to get. It's not illegal, but it basically is. To get an abortion in Belize, you need the written consent of multiple doctors to sign off on that procedure. Then you must find a doctor who is willing to provide that procedure. And there's conscientious objection where doctors can recuse themselves and not offer the service. So again, let's say you're a poor woman living in the rural area of Kikakur Island. There's only two doctors there. You have to hope that both of them will say yes to you having an abortion. And then you have to find another doctor in the mainland or another island to say yes, and then find another doctor, another service provider that will provide the abortion service. What ends up happening is, is women find other means to receive an abortion, both due to the stigma of getting an abortion the legal way, for instance, having to go to the doctor and showing signs of being pregnant and then having an abortion, but they may find alternative means of doing so. For instance, with so-called abortion cocktails like mifepristone and misoprostol, they, they you take in tandem to induce an abortion sometimes, as well as more drastic measures, basically. For instance, one uh, public health worker that I spoke with said he often um, hears of women throwing themselves down the stairs to cause an abortion. Again, very drastic measures, but again, this speaks to the fact that if women cannot find legal ways to access abortions, they will find ways to access abortions no matter what. From a public health perspective, that's why it's important to provide the service because it's going to be provided in a most likely unsafer environment otherwise. Additionally, men are ignored in disease surveillance. If you're only talking about women, so let's say women should not get pregnant because of Zika virus, men think in their minds, okay, this is a woman's issue now. I don't need to worry about it. So as the doctor I was speaking, uh, mentioning earlier in this presentation mentions, you are only looking at half of the possible cases. This makes men not care about Zika. If you're only testing pregnant women, for example, men say again, okay, this is a woman's issue. I don't need, I don't need to get tested. I don't need to worry about it. Thus shaping and engendering a disease that is, as it is called in anthropology, to primarily be something that is a woman's concern or a woman's issue, despite the reality, for instance, it being spread via STI or via mosquito, as an example. However, I would add on to this that you really aren't targeting pregnant, or you aren't targeting women, you're targeting pregnant women, because in Belize, you can get a free Zika virus test if you are a pregnant woman in the country. And that means you're ignoring men and women that are not trying to get pregnant. So then you have an even smaller subset of the population that you actually are getting epidemiological data from. Again, this is going to shape epidemiology and the so-called true caseload you may be seeing in the country. As Nurse Anna says, the government is only testing for pregnant women. I call it treat as you see. She literally means if you look pregnant, you may be given a Zika virus test. Remember, you, you, you can't get it in Kikakur, you must travel elsewhere. So now this pregnant woman who may have Zika virus or is, or is concerned she may have Zika virus has to travel somewhere else to get the service. Which again is an economic and time constraint for her. And she may inadvertently even expose herself to further infections by going somewhere else that may have Zika virus as an example or spreading it that way as well. This is tied to reproductive governance because again, this is the, the government basically saying they have a want to, for instance, control pregnancy because of Zika virus, but also they have the ability to actually do that in terms of their biopower by, let's say, restricting access to abortion services, instead favoring sterilization or people using condoms in the country. And I would say that condom use in the country is very low in terms of the statistics, and also sterilization is considered to be a very drastic measure However, sterilization is the most common means of controlling pregnancy in Belize because of a lack of limited options otherwise. 
adding to these complications that primarily affect epidemiology also too, of course, is that Zika virus is, again, usually asymptomatic. You could have the disease and have no idea. Additionally, multiple diseases can have similar symptoms, but you must pay for, at a clinic, for instance, as a private clinic, for these tests individually. So for example, if I walk in thinking that I may have Zika virus, the doctor may tell me, oh, really, it could be Zika virus or dengue fever or malaria. I have to test these individually, and each test has a cost affected to it. The minimum wage in Belize is about basically 350 Belizean dollars. And to get a test for Zika virus, this could cost about 100 Belizean dollars. Think about that in terms, again, the time and economic costs to get a private test for a disease that you may not even have. I could get tested for Zika virus and it come back negative, but I still could potentially have dengue fever, and I don't know that until I get tested for either or. And from what I found in my research is, when given this choice, many people will opt for the dengue fever test over the Zika virus test, because there's a perception that this is a more costly in terms of health condition for both men and women, as an example, which is shaped by, again, disease discourses and how people talk about and think about Zika virus as sort of like a pregnant woman's issue as well. Despite the fact that, of course, you can transmit it to a pregnant woman either through sex or via mosquito, as an example. So as Dr. Alvarez here and another, and another doctor on the island puts it, Statistically, for it to be considered endemic, there have to be confirmed cases. As a doctor seeing symptoms, I can see there is Zika, but they don't get tested. So officially, Zika isn't endemic, but unofficially, it is endemic. What Dr. Alvarez is really saying here is people are coming in showing signs of rash, of headaches, conjunctivitis, but he doesn't know if it's actually endemic on the island from an epidemiological point of view because people aren't getting tested. There is no data to support that claim. So he can think that it's endemic based on what he's seeing, but he doesn't know that because there's not enough data to support that claim. This creates clinical ambiguities of doctors, for instance, treating patients, but then when they ask if they want to get tested for Zika virus or dengue fever, the, the individual may say no because they think that it's too costly as an example. So what do you do there from a public health perspective if no one's getting tested, and again, testing is how you actually get the more intensive fumigation by hand, because if you have a confirmed dengue test, the Ministry of Health will send people there to fumigate the environment. But if no one's getting tested, they're not going to fumigate by hand, and you have to rely on the sporadic fumigation by truck that is less effective but covers a wider area. So in terms of potential findings that I presented, um, along with many others to the Village Council, as an example, and also local um, physicians and healthcare workers, is that limited state engagement, so let's say a neoliberal environment, has created contexts of disease risk engendered of apathy concerning Zika. They are creating environments where it is easier to contract mosquito-borne diseases because, again, there's a high concentration of environmental risk factors for mosquito breeding. But at the same time, because of discourses that say pregnant women should get tested for Zika or women should not get pregnant, this becomes a basically a gender disease. Additionally, on top of that, policymakers must address healthcare disparities and structural inequalities if they want to effectively manage endemic mosquito-borne disease transmission. There are some ways to do this, and anthropology likes to focus on on-the-ground, more pragmatic solutions. And that can look very different if you don't have that understanding of the local context to be able to inform your recommendations, basically. So, for example, I found that the majority of these free trash bins are provided in the affluent, or at least more affluent, commercial district of the island. So if all the free trash cans are there, this creates a perception that the Ministry of Health and the Village Council favors basically the aesthetics of the island more than the health of the island. Because again, a lot of people live in the rural area and the rural area does not have a lot of access to these free trash bins. Instead, they are expected to pay for garbage collection. 
And many people don't because, again, they can either not afford to do so or they don't want to do so because they think this is something that the village council should do for them. From the village council's point of view, which is also important to consider here, they need that basically tax revenue to be able to fund other interventions and interventional services and also development on the island. So we can't always just look at the stakeholders as being the community members. They may also be the village council itself, which has a different agenda than let's say someone on the ground, a local worker as an example. So you must also keep that in mind to be a, basically a translator of these different perspectives and find solutions that again, may not be agreeable to everybody, but are understandable to everybody as best as you can. You will never make everyone happy. And that applies to a lot of things in life. Additionally, I found that the village council sometimes has larvicides. And these basically are tablets that you drop in water that can kill mosquito larvae and eggs um, before they can develop. However, there was limited knowledge of this service among islanders, and also there was a limited amount of tablets that were available. So I recommended that they expand the service, ask the Ministry of Health basically for more tablets to be able to better control mosquitoes before they get to that quote unquote bad part. And then additionally, unless there is more adequate testing services on the island and in Belize in general, we won't really have a good understanding of what's going on. This ties into the structures and the stuff aspect I mentioned earlier in Paul Farmer. If you don't have the objects and the space to be able to treat and monitor diseases, you really don't know how bad of a problem of a, a disease is in the country. This also, of course, applies to COVID-19. If people aren't getting tested, we, we can make best guess sort of assumptions based on disease models and let's say population patterns, but if everyone doesn't get tested, you really don't know. And as you know, with COVID-19, many people just don't get tested. So keep that in mind and know that when you're talking about Zika virus, dengue fever, Ebola, COVID-19, you see a lot of similar patterns because you, of course, culture is going to shape how we think about diseases and interact with them in similar ways because they are themselves, on the one hand, biological constructs and also social constructs. They are biosocial objects, essentially.